No. No, there's no camera, Colonel. I'm afraid I'm not. That's, I'm not handsome enough to be on it anyway. You shouldn't be talking. You should see this bulldog face. Oh, that's good. Well, how are you today? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. You definitely have a radio voice, my friend. And a radio face, apparently. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, well, it's nice. To, it's nice yeah. to meet you. Same here. I'm glad you reached out. Um, we have a lot of connections um, with the islands, and uh, actually. Quite a few operations or or support missions out there, so it's good that you've availed our, availed us the opportunity, to maybe provide some clarity on our mission, our purpose, our structure, all that good stuff. Well, let's begin that. We're coming today, uh, Voices of Roatan, via Skype <coughs> with Colonel Kirk Dorr of the Joint Task Force Bravo with Sotocano. Um, if you hear some delay or some weird stuff going on. Um, that's the way the internet works with Skype sometimes. So, uh, first of all, you've been around the world in some pretty dangerous places personally, so I want to thank you for your service, Colonel. No, thank you very much. And uh, my assignment as it as I horizon out here shortly uh, and depart Honduras and Central America, this has been an absolutely astounding assignment to to be in this part of Western Hemisphere to learn the struggles uh, and to the cultures down in, in this region. It's, uh, it's probably been my finest assignment, my most enjoyable assignment. When an 18-year-old kayaker became lost at sea a few weeks ago, I was part of an Internet thread that was going around the island. And one of the first questions that was asked was, has anybody been in touch with the airbase at Sotocano? It's not the first time the base has entered into a situation to save lives here on Roatan. So... What is the mission of JTF Bravo? So the mission itself is to conduct and support joint interagency, intergovernmental, and multinational operations uh, or activities throughout the Central American uh, area in order to, to enable a whole government approach towards strengthening regional security, stability, um, and support our partner nation. So that's our formal mission statement. We have three functional mission areas, uh, and I'll describe each one of them. Number one is support to humanitarian assistance or disaster relief operations. Um, and that, that mission thread goes all the way back. Um, now, we've been here for over three decades now, but um, a real turning point for the JTF here in Honduras was our response to Hurricane Mitch, in 1981, as you may know, it was just an absolutely devastating event, um, at which point this task force and the air base affiliated with it really was the lifeline for uh, relief supplies, relief effort, uh, as everyone from the U.N. to non-governmental organizations to the Department of State um, pushed relief supplies into this area, which were ferried out by JTF helicopters, as well as a lot of rescue operations for folks that were stranded. Uh, and ever since then, really, we've been the, uh, the, the, the unit of choice in this region for that type of response. So that's humanitarian assistance disaster relief. The second mission set is what we call building partner capacity. And that is uh, by, with, and through our partner nations um, working to develop, evolve, um, train partner nation military security forces uh, so that they have the capacity to uh, both protect uh, uh, sovereign their sovereign territory from foreign threats, but also uh, uh, cope with uh, internal threats. So that's building partnership capacity. Uh, the third thing that our mission uh, portfolio is called countering transnational organized crime. So we work with, again, various uh, U.S. entities and, and agencies, as well as our, our partner nations, to get our arms around the uh, the drug flow, uh, both uh, through the uh, the land bridge, but also in in the north. So, um, again, that has been a mission set for quite some time. Uh, those are, are three mission sets, and uh, again, for over three decades, we've been performing those based out of this uh, footprint here, which is the Honduras called Pomerola. Um, as we call it, Sotocano Air Base, named after a famous Honduran fighter pilot, Enrique Sotocano. 
Tell us about the operation uh, that recently took place with the Air Sea Rescue and, and how that came down and uh, how it was mobilized. And, of course, it was a, a good news event at the end. It really was. And it was, as I would describe it, kind of a non-standard approach. There were true search and, re- uh, search, uh, and recovery experts out there, uh, many in the Coast Guard. Uh, the Navy has a lot of capacity. Um, we are often called into such situations because of some of the unique capabilities, such as our, our rotary wing helicopters and, uh, and the devices and equipment that we have on board, such as uh, winches, uh, rescue baskets. We don't have professionals. We don't have swimmers such as the Coast Guard has, but we do train uh, our, our onboard uh, recovery experts um, in, to operate over water in places uh, such as your area outside of Roatan. So we're not the Coast Guard, but we are a pretty decent capability in this type of circumstance. So it was interesting in that this, this, uh, was predominantly led by civilian entities, and normally that's you know undertaken by uh, a military, a Coast Guard entity. So that was unique. Number one, uh, number two was the very swift flow of communications from people like yourself, who alerted uh, everybody from the embassy to Honduran officials uh, to get us pulled into the planning effort as we worked through the request for support through my, uh, our parent command, which is United States Southern Command based out of Florida, uh, to make sure that uh, they were tracking the situation. They have an actual re- personal recovery cell in their headquarters where they, they actually cover down or follow incidents like this very closely. They can vector everything from aircraft to satellites, things of that nature, uh, to, to identify the lost uh, American citizen. And we have our own personal recovery center within our headquarters. So we're immediately upon the initial reports, we were dialoguing and starting to get our arms around the the, uh, the situation. Of course, provided all sorts of information from folks there on the island. And so although the weather that day was incredibly poor, uh, we couldn't even get an aircraft off the ground initially during the daylight hours. We planned throughout the night based off feedback we were receiving from our friends there in Roatan. So, and through the night, close coordination with U.S. Southern Command, we got approval to execute. We had done all the analysis. We had prepped the crews. We brought all the equipment we needed on board. So at 0515, um, I, called my, uh, I called my aviation operations center and said, okay, when are we launching the aircraft? And they replied, sir, based on your guidance, we launched 10 minutes ago. And I was thrilled that they were already moving at the break of light and on station uh, about two hours later. And of course, as you know, about zero nine eighteen, based off a, based off a sighting from a civilian fixed wing aircraft, relaying a report to our helicopter crew. The helicopter crew was able to vector to the location and winch the um, or hoist the eighteen uh, year old citizen to uh, to the aircraft, with, and then they delivered him to the airport and to his family. And it was incredible. I don't know what you think, but it was incredible that he didn't that he didn't suffer any effects. Of exposure, and that was a miracle in and of itself. So, uh, we were very proud to be a part of this again, um, civilian driven, and it was remarkable. I think the flow of information was key. Mark Flanning is one of the guys on the island that uh, really jumped out and, and made all of those phone calls. I don't believe he slept until uh, the young man was located. Uh, I don't think people think- actually realize how difficult it is to find a kayak floating in water 18 miles away from anywhere. It is very, very difficult. And, um, you know, there's also considerations for station time. You know, th- those aircraft um, flying over large expanses of territory really fuel drives everything. And so, um, you know, you've got to manage their time. And then what behind the scenes, what we were doing, uh, we were echeloning other aircraft. So we were prepared to launch other additional aircraft to get a broader search pattern and to keep us on station for a time, we never dreamed that we would it would um, the would would result in success so soon. Uh, but yeah, it is very very difficult, as you know. The the ocean expanse is immense, um, but we're pretty confident. You know, I tell a story. I had a, I was in that morning. I had a meeting in the embassy with an ambassador, and I he asked me a question of what I thought, 
open ended question. And I looked at him and I just, you know, had a, a feeling of confidence. I looked at him in the eye and I said, Sir, Mr. Ambassador, if he's out there, our boys are gonna find him and our boys are gonna get him home. And then, you know, lucky for me, in dramatic fashion, someone burst in the about ten minutes later and announced that we had picked them up. So needless to say I look I look like you know, I look pretty good that day. But um I'm I'm just so happy that the collaboration of the aircraft, the fixed wing aircraft can cover more terrain faster. Uh, and just the, the target handoff, the identification and the communications of them uh, was, it was better than you know, a lot of military operations I've seen. So again, uh, I think we got lucky, but we had some really dedicated people that, as you said, did not sleep until we came up with success that morning. I also want to add that uh, there are a lot of people here on the island uh, that are in the water all the time, and they know those currents, and they know exactly where they're going to go, and they predicted that that would be where that young man's kayak would be. So uh, teaming everybody together was truly a great joint task force operation, I guess. It, it was, and I just want, um, you know, I've got certain authorities to launch aircraft, particularly if you've got an American citizen that's in distress. So really, uh, my parameters are life, limb, or eyesight. You know, I have a lot of latitude and authorities to launch U.S. equipment and, and put people at risk. What people don't understand is, yes, it's important. Our first concern is about people in the water, people in distress, or the medical condition. Uh, but we got to be able to, to ensure that we get once we launch the aircraft, we can retrieve the aircraft, the crew, and those people that are rescued. So, as you know, the weather out there can be very tricky. Um, it's probably one of the most difficult regions to fly a helicopter in. I'm very proud of our pilots, some of, them, some of whom have returned two, three times to serve down here uh, because they enjoy the challenge so much. Um, but the, it really – I just want the American citizen uh, or the traveler out there at Roatan to know that if they're, in distress, if they're in distress, the incredible service members here uh, based out of sort of are coming for them. Uh, they are coming for them, and, and it will take uh, – you know, they will, we will give everything we have to make sure that, that um, those people in distress uh, are recovered. Well, Colonel Kirk, uh, much luck with your uh, your next life, and uh, uh, it's nice. It's a pleasure to meet you, and thank you for everything. And uh, on behalf of, uh, and I'm speaking for everybody here, thank you uh, for everything you do for everybody here on Roatan. It's an honor to serve our country. It's an honor to serve our citizens wherever they may be. I'm just proud, and I think everybody should be proud of the young you know, 18, 20 year old, 30 year old service members who are putting themselves in, in harm's way every single day. Uh, it may not be a place where folks are shooting at them, but the dangers are still exist and they go out there and they're so brave and uh, we're very proud of them. Thanks for the interview. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. God bless you.